Uh, t- today, uh, Professor Larry Crum and I will give you a uh, kind of short 45-minute presentation uh, with a topic of education and research in medical imaging and uh, image-guided therapy track within the Department of Bioengineering. And I will give you an overview and also uh, some of the, the medical imaging, particularly in the diagnostic ultrasound side. And then uh, Professor Crum will uh, give us a short presentation on therapeutic ultrasound side. And I will come back and present you uh, on the educational the track we developed. And then both of us will be available for questions uh, if you have any. So if you look at the bioengineering history, it goes all the way back to 1967 when Dr. Roshima set up the Center for Bioengineering. And one of the research the program at that time was ultrasound. Those of you who, who attended Don Baker's talk about five weeks ago, he, he was there at that time uh, doing ultrasound research and ultrasound instrumentation development for cardiovascular research in living animals or intact animals. So it has been uh, part of the bioengineering since the beginning. And it, we review medical imaging in one slide. It's the uh, probably most important clinical diagnostic tool available. And there are many modalities. And it uh, consists of we have data acquisition and data processing and uh, display and uh, visualization, sometimes analysis. These days, even computer-aided diagnosis based on image information. And uh, there are kind of two kinds of medical imaging, projected 2D uh, images, like a, a general X-ray imaging, and nuclear medicine imaging, like a gamma camera. But there are a lot more the, the tomographic imaging modalities uh, developed since 1970, including X-ray CT, MR, PET, SPEC, and ultrasound scanners. And medical imaging uh, produced uh, several Nobel Prizes uh, starting from the Rentgen in 1901 to Hounsfield in 1979 or something like that. And uh, MRI, even though the NMR, uh, the, the, the discovery of NMR produced one Nobel Prize, MRI uh, is expecting uh, another Nobel Prize in the next five to ten years. So it's a rich area for the, the research and development and clinical applications. So this is a summary of the, the tomographic, tomographic modalities, X-ray, CT, MR, PET, ultrasound. And it has, yeah, it has a unique signal source, its own. And uh, the, they detect different things, like uh, X-ray, CT, material density, ultrasound, acoustic reflectance, or impi- acoustic impedance mismatch. So we are detecting reflectance. And uh, the MRI, we are detecting nucleus density. And uh, imaging resolution uh, varies from high resolution of the X-ray CT to uh, low resolution of PET. And imaging time varies again from few seconds in X-ray CT to real time in ultrasound, even though there are a lot of variations. Like uh, in MRI, if you want to sacrifice the sensitivity and resolution, you can go even real time. And uh, the, the X-ray CT and uh, PET involves those, which yeah, we have to be careful in, in using this. And then applications are like anatomical imaging in X-ray CT, and PET is more physiological and functional or metabolic function, and MRI is more anatomic. But in the 90s, they moved, they have been trying to move into functional imaging. And cost, obviously, PET is highest. And MR is next, and then CT, and ultrasound. Ultrasound these days can range from about $20,000 to quarter million dollars. So one application of the, the medical imaging modality, so this is a, using X-ray CT to find whether uh, the, the patient uh, will have any, this is a prostate cancer patient, whether in doing direct therapy, putting the radioactive seeds in the, in the prostate, whether the, the doctor will have any problem 
due to this pubic arch bone here. This is using X-ray CT, and you can see X-ray CT gives you very uh, clear anatomical images. But yeah, you know it. They, it takes time and it takes uh, you yeah, know expenses. It costs money. And so what we did was we developed the ultrasound based uh, the pubic arch interference assessment technique, and uh, it works. Even though you can see ultrasound images are very fuzzy, a uh, yeah, lot of a lot more noise, but we can see prostate here, darker area is prostate, and we can detect the pubic arch bone more reliably using ultrasound, and advantage is uh, it's cheaper, and it's more accurate. And another uh, thing that we have to consider, clinicians need, is a lot of the patients before surgery, they, they get the, the images taken preoperatively, day before or so in CT and MR, but it, during the surgery, uh, the, the surgeons don't know where the, t the target is, especially when they start the resecting the tumor. So some kind of the, the real-time registration between preoperative images and real-time images uh, allowing even deformation, because if you are handling the, the organ like a liver and prostate and others, they are not hard. The neurosurgery, because of the frame we have, or the skull, they, they can be considered more rigid, but other organs are not. So allowing that kind of the, the, uh, deformation, the multimodality registration, real time, is another key need in the operating room. So this shows the, the, the ultrasound image, and this shows the preoperative the MR image. So as the the doctor moves the ultrasound probe around and examines certain area, then computer, our algorithm can regenerate, go to the preoperatively acquired MRI image and go to regenerate that slice. It doesn't have to be uh, the perpendicular or parallel to a certain plane. And functional MRI uh, has been tried a lot in the last about eight years or so. And the basic idea is uh, we, for this case, we provide visual stimulation to the subject, and then uh, if we, we are careful in measuring the change, like a change of signal intensity, this is only a few percent at maximum, then we should be able to isolate the, the brain cortex area responsible for that, the, the, the visual perception. So that's the main idea of the functional MRI. And obviously, if you have a, like a nine Tesla machine, the signal to noise ratio sensitivity will be much higher compared to the normal, the, the human 1.5 Tesla machine. So there is a trend to go into the higher, the magnetic field of uh, the MRI machine to three, four Tesla. And then we are approaching the limit of whether it will be harmful to, to the tissues. So that kind of change of signal intensity we detected, and no, it's, it's coming. Change is coming from the change of blood oxygen level. If we generate, provide stimulus, that area the the uh, blood oxygen level will change, and we are changing that, and that will uh, be translated into the change of signal uh, the intensity. So this is one example of functional MRI. Uh, motor area of the brain cortex. So where, if you ask the subject to, okay, tap your finger and then relax, tap your finger and relax. You do many times and you do the signal averaging, you, you can kind of isolate the area of the uh, brain cortex is responsible for finger tapping. So biomedical imaging in general uh, is a very important diagnostic and research tool. Not only diagnostic, these days with biomedical imaging you can understand the, the surface of the material. You can understand other, uh, like a, with molecular imaging you can go into uh, how like a gene therapy is working. So uh, as I just described earlier, we have projection to the imaging modalities, to the, uh, the tomographic imaging modalities, 
And we are uh, always going after higher sensitivity and higher specificity. Okay, in, in detecting uh, like a breast tumor, we want to have a always higher sensitivity and higher specificity. But unfortunately, if you go for the higher sensitivity, then uh, the specificity will suffer. If you go for the higher specificity, so it's a kind of, uh, you cannot achieve both. And improving resolution and image quality, the, if you compare CT and MR image quality of early 80s to now, there is no comparison. And equipment getting smaller, so now we are uh, seeing micro PET, micro CT, where the small animal, like a 30 gram mice, can be imaged intact. And uh, toward cellular and molecular imaging, and toward higher dimension, from 2D to 3D, 3D to 4D, and toward real-time imaging. So, as we have seen, like a CT and MR, it used to take a long time, but now it's getting yeah, down to second, or if you can go down to the sub-second. If you want to use an uh, image transfer, the, the CT machine, you can have a, like a 50 millisecond resolution. Obviously, you, you don't get free. There is no free lunch. Your signal-to-noise ratio will suffer, and resolution will suffer, and etc. So, some examples. The ultrasound. Initially, it was static and not real-time modality. So, in getting one uh, the ultrasound image of certain area, you had to move the transducer for a long time, and you kind of put the transducer, one element transducer, get the signal, move it to the next one, get the signal. So, it was static and not real-time modality. It became dynamic and real-time due to advances in transducer and image processing and computing. That happened in, in the 80s, early 80s. And because of that, uh, it finds more and more application. And uh, the, I will show you the, the, the fle flexibility due to programmability. And now it's going into 3D ultrasound and it's going into portable ultrasound that uh, Dr. Crum pioneered in mid-90s. And imaging small animals now, rather than uh, sacrificing the animal for like a drug studies or some you know, drug development studies and others, now uh, we can uh, we can use uh, this imaging modalities for small animal, which is uh, you know, much better. We have a micro PET, SPEC, MRI, MRS, the MR spectroscopy, optical imaging, and we can characterize transgenic animal phenotypes and gene expression and pharma pharmaceutical uh, distribution, pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics. And we can link specific genes to molecules and cells and organ functions. So th this one is the, uh, the project that Dr. Crum pioneered in, in mid-1994 and uh, with ATL and VLSI technology and ATL spun up uh, the company, Sonocyte, and they have now about 150 uh, people working. And this is a, like a 5.4 pound laptop ultrasound machine costing about $20,000. And you can see it has even the color flow capability. That one used uh, the uh, ASIC, application specific IC chip, and uh, we worked with Siemens using programmable chips, and this is the board we developed, and then Siemens integrated into the Siemens ultrasound machine, and then it enabled uh, all kinds of new applications. One thing I learned from this project is this kind of advances and uh, new applications is we did not predict this. We thought we designed this for 3D ultrasound purpose but it finds more application and more use outside 3D ultrasound. So the, the, the biggest application is this seascape, where uh, you, you move the transducer, and in real time, panoramic image will be generated. So a lot of the hospitals are using uh, that uh, seascape capability of that ultrasound machine in generating the, the whole feeder image in one scan, rather than seeing on, only a portion of the image. And then, uh, yeah, 
other doctors use this uh, in studying blood flow in, in, yeah, from the top of the arm to the bottom of the arm. In, again, using one scan of the ultrasound rather than uh, using maybe 10, 20 the shots and then doctor trying to reconstruct that in his or her yeah, the brain. And this was our original intended application of 3D ultrasound. It's not easy to see under this sliding, but you can see the field of space. And then the clinician can move the, the, this 3D the object around in, in real time in any way he or she wishes. So this was our intended application. But a uh, lot more than 3D ultrasound uh, the, the doctors are using. Like the Cscape is the most important one and then there are other the applications. So another example is molecular imaging. Well, what is molecular imaging? The opportunities to use imaging to answer new questions posed by advances in, advances in molecular biology. And uh, it's more chemical than structural imaging. Because more, the macroscopic imaging are more the, the anatomical. But this is uh, some anatomical, but, but more chemical. Like a special emphasis of post-genomic questions we can try to answer using molecular imaging techniques. And phenotype characterization, gene therapy, angiogenesis, autopsis, drug resistance, growth factor and receptors, and metastatic potential. So a lot of, this is a dynamically changing area right now. And uh, the NIH uh, just set up a new institute called uh, NIH Institute of Biomedical Imaging and Bioengineering. So the imaging has a very high uh, importance uh, in, uh, in not only in NIH, but in outside area. And like a micro MRI imaging at UW, yeah, the UW radiology department has micro the MRI capability with a uh, one millimeter thick slice with two millimeter uh, offset. But it's yeah, s slow, 50 second uh, time resolution. Uh, by the way, this slide uh, came from Professor Ken Cron of uh, radiology. And it can, the image, 30 gram, the mouse. And you have to have a physical restraint. And uh, like uh, the, the blood oxygenation, uh, as I said earlier in, in functional imaging metabolism, compare wild type and the creatine uh, kinase knockout mice. So. The, what we have at UW in terms of the, the molecular imaging as of this month, strength is in uh, chemistry of new traces. We have a strong micro MRI capability. So those of you uh, wanting to use micro MRI, uh, you need to contact uh, Professor Ken Cron. And potential strengths in collaborative coupling of good questions with appropriate technology. Bioengineering is trying to initiate optical imaging program in consultation with uh, the radiology and neurosurgery. And primate PET, the positron emission tomography scanner is here. Mouse PET is being built. So soon uh, you might be able to uh, image uh, mice using uh, micro PET. So at this point, uh, I would like to hand over to Professor Larry Crum, who is one of the few pioneers in the world on therapeutic ultrasound. And he was recruited to UW in 1992 as a principal investigator at APL and research professor in bioengineering. And before that, uh, he, uh, he, has been, he had been a uh, professor at University of Mississippi and before that, he has been a faculty member of U.S. Naval Academy. And before that, he got his uh, the degree, Ph.D., Master's, and B.S. degree in physics and mathematics from Ohio University. Larry. Thanks, Youngman. Youngman asked me to talk about uh, what we're doing in therapeutic ultrasound and I thought the best way to do it was to talk about what the graduate students are doing in therapeutic ultrasound 
And so uh, most of this work is going on at the Center for uh, Industrial Medical Ultrasound, which is housed in the Applied Physics Lab. But many of the uh, faculty or the staff members in this center have joint appointments in bioengineering. So uh, Younglin pointed out the remarkable capabilities of diagnostic ultrasound. These images of fetuses now are almost as good as pictures. Those are gallstones. And it used to be it was very difficult to determine you had gallstones. And now this is a 3D image of the vascular regions of the kidney. And so you can even see blood vessels at various stages in the body. And so one of the things that have been, has been uh, 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 some efforts that have been made is how do you improve diagnostic imaging? And so some work done with Wen Chen, Dr. Chen, uh, and who's working on a, a PhD. Uh, and he already has his MD and Mike Averkiu, who is one of the uh, postdocs in our group was to use stabilized microbubbles to enhance the diagnostic imaging. So how does this work if you have an acoustic pulse coming in and strikes the microbubble? Then it can cause this bubble to oscillate. You get a bubble echo, then you can get an echo spectrum, and you can get a harmonic spectrum. And so you can image at the harmonic rather than the fundamental. So you enhance your, your capabilities that way. So here's an example of uh, how you do this ultrasound contrast agents to enhance uh, contrast. First of all, you inject this uh, contrast agent. The myocardium, which is this area right here, is now fully perfused. But you then hit a, bring in a sort of a high intensity pulse of diagnostic ultrasound. And I can say, by the way, that the intensity of diagnostic ultrasound is on the order of milliwatts per centimeter square, while some of these intensities that I'll talk on the order of kilowatts per centimeter square. So we have six orders of magnitude change in intensity here. So now the contrast is going to replenish. We're going to destroy all these bubbles here. Then the contrast is going to replenish. And you will see then the migration of these contrast agents into the myocardium. And you can see why we want to do that. If someone has a heart attack, then we want to be able to determine Watch this splash you see now that destroyed all the microbubbles in the myocardium. And now if one has a heart attack, and you want to be able to determine if the whole myocardium is perfused. And so you can determine perhaps with ultrasound in real time whether if someone has a heart attack, there is some damage to the myocardium. Anyway, Wen is working with that uh, to develop these contrast agents. One of the things you can do with contrast agents is that you can have them carry drugs because in a sense you can image these contrast agents, you could also have them carry drugs. And so one of the projects we're working on is suppose there's a blood clot, you can put in a catheter, dump the contrast agent right into the clot, and then you can image and see where the clot is rather than using x-ray angiography. But then if you have a, a toxic or a thrombolytic drug inside that contrast agent, you can break it right inside the clot and dissolve the clot. And so we're working with a company called Ecos, in which they have built a catheter that will go either into the leg to dissolve clots in the leg, into the heart to dissolve clots in the heart, or right now they're using it for dissolving clots in the brain. And you can see that this is a very small catheter on the order of one millimeter in diameter. This goes all the way into the, to the, uh, uh, the interior uh, uh, cranial or cerebral artery. That's only about a millimeter in diameter, but that's a transducer there. And that transducer there, not only, uh, not only uh, this system, not only releases drug, but the ultrasound enhances the effect of the drug. And so this was a, a human female that had a massive heart, a massive stroke. Four hours after the stroke, she had this whole area of her brain was uh, uh, ischemic. That is, no blood to this particular area of the brain. The uh, catheter was put in here, released the drug, and the ultrasound was turned on. And just in a few minutes, 60 minutes, this whole area was restored. This, this uh, person now is walking around with very few uh, complications. Also, this is some work from Tyrone Porter, who's working with uh, Alan Hoffman and Pat Staten. And what, what the intention is here is that ultrasound, working with some smart polymers, can actually do sonoperation. That is to say, ultrasound can enhance transport through the cellular membrane and also the nuclear membrane. And so in this particular case here, with ultrasound, one is actually able to transfer 
a genetic agents into the nucleus and they are expressed and so one has transfection and in a sense you can do gene therapy with the system. Connie Kwok, working with Buddy Ratner and, and Tom Horbett and others, has built a very interesting system in which suppose that you have a little uh, sponge-like material here, you coat it with one of their very smart self-assembly monolayers or self-assembly molecular systems, and this makes it essentially impermeable to the release of this drug, and suppose this is insulin. Now when you hit it with ultrasound, you break up that surface layer and the insulin comes out. And you can do this by potentially turning it on and off by uh, using ultrasound as a gate to release insulin. That's making nice progress. Youngman referred to the fact that we were uh, working on building these small portable ultrasound machines. And the reason we might want to do that is they're very good at determining the amount of blood that might be located in various abdominal cavities and so if you run your car into a tree or something you're bleeding internally there are very few symptoms the way to do that is to inject a needle in there now and suck out the blood to see whether you're bleeding or not that's an invasive procedure with ultrasound and using this 3d scanning algorithm you can actually measure the amount of blood that's collected in various regions in the body Dalia Sokolov is working on a project in which you probably know, some, heard of this before, extracorporeal shockwave lithotripsy. If you set off a shockwave and cause it to focus at a particular spot, you can put your kidney stone, in fact, you can put your kidney right at that focus inside a lithotriptor tank and you can break up kidney stones in vivo. Dahlia is looking at the fact inside this collagen bag which happens to be the lens of a cow's eye and so you can see that I could pr produce a therapeutic uh, lesion in the side of tissue and control it by this uh, system and not damage the intervening tissue. We have used this uh, concept of HIFU to produce what we call acoustocautery, acoustocoagulation or acoustocautery you see, if you have a transducer and focus it like that, you sort of like have a blowtorch. And that blowtorch could be used in systems like that to introduce cauterization. And we think that this has a very useful application. Here's another movie that will show you, in a sense, how this thing works. This is a lesion that is being produced. We've cut 
this a liver of a rabbit, and now we're applying ultrasound to this particular site here. You see, and what we're doing is doing a custocautery, that is, we're cooking the tissue, and you see we very quickly stop bleeding, and one can even use devices that one uses interoperatively. Do you see that what we're doing is doing cauterization, and we can stop the bleeding very quickly? So, these devices have perhaps lots of application. Now, one of the things that we also have to do is to compute because it's very difficult to treat lots of animals with these systems. And so one of the things we do is we've done a simulation. And Francesco Cura is just about to do his dissertation or else that for five years he's been writing a computer code to do simulation of Haifu. And in this particular case, it shows what happens if you do not have a blood vessel. And this is a lesion that's developing in real time. And this is what happens if you have a blood vessel in the past and there's very little heating in the interior of the blood vessel because of two things. One is the flow. You might even be able to see the flow, the blood flow carrying the heat away here and very little absorption inside the blood vessel itself. And so we're very proud of this computer code that does that. Sandy Polyachik is also about to finish up and she wondered if the HIFU itself would induce coagulation and with a system here like this she propagates ultrasound into a little tube which has platelet-rich plasma. And she found out that, yes, she can not only activate, but she can aggregate the blood platelets at certain intensities of ultrasound. And if there's collagen exposed, it might be difficult to see it, but there are little strands here of collagen. And when you would treat it with high food, the blood platelets collect to the collagen. And this is the, the very beginnings of the acoustic coagulation sequence to form a clot. One of the things that's kind of exciting is that there are lots of systems that one might be able to, to use to stop bleeding without causing much other damage to the body. For example, people have varicose veins. It's a difficult treatment. You have to treat this with surgery. People also have things called esophageal varices. If you drink too much and you put too much pressure on your liver, the blood vessels in your esophagus and also the whole GI tract sort of swell up and then they break and you bleed internally. And so... Chu Ha here is also an MD in GI, and he's doing his PhD working on this. And what he would like to do is to go in and take a, a blood vessel, punch a hole in it, which is what he's done here, it starts to bleed, and then apply HIFU. Remember that sort of blowtorch type thing? He can seal the thing very rapidly, and he also can include the blood vessel. And this is not a severe burn. This thing heals itself and so he envisions making one of these devices to go inside the esophagus or, in fact, the whole GI tract and stop bleeding and so forth and treating things like varicose veins and so forth. Uh, one of the, 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 the strengths of ultrasound is that you can use ultrasound both for imaging and therapy. And here I won't show this movie, but here is a, an example of a case in which we have punctured a hole in a femoral artery like one does five million times a, a year in the United States when one does catheterization to open up uh, areas in the heart or the brain and so forth. But when you remove that catheter, of course, you have a bleeding site. So here's an example in a pig. We've catheterized the animal. When we relieve, uh, remove the catheter, you can use Doppler ultrasound to see the bleeding along the track that you remove the catheter. And now when we turn on the HIFU, and this is indicated by this artifact here, we get a little hypoechogenic spot in which we can move the focus of the high food transducer to the bleeding area, and then we stop the bleeding, and you can see that the, the vessel is still patent, that is, it's still carrying blood, but that's not bleeding in that particular area, and now you can see that we've stopped bleeding in this particular animal. Uh, there are lots of applications then of high food. Uh, Arthur Chan is working on using high food to treat uh, a very common case in women, that is, uterine fibroids, uh, uh, 300,000 women per year in the U.S., are treated for uterine fibroids, which means they, their uterus is removed or you do a myomectomy, and therefore they're no longer fertile. And so Arthur and, and Sharon Vese is working on a device to be actually able to treat these uterine fibroids with both imaging and therapeutic ultrasound. Here's some preliminary results. They used the uterine fibroid tumor, put it in a mouse. They treated it with HIFU like this. And the tumor was growing, but one treatment of HIFU caused almost all of the tumors to shrink. And those that didn't shrink, they were retreated and they shrank a little bit. So this is a very promising thing for uh, use of HIFU. Uh, I just came back, uh, a number of us just came back from the first international symposium on HIFU uh, in China. There were over 150 people there. 
And in China, there are nine companies making devices for using image-guided therapy, and they have treated over 6,000 patients for a variety of cancers and so forth in China. That is the only place in the world in which this is going on with the treatment of patients and being able to sell devices there three to five years ahead of us. We're trying to catch up and we're trying to develop this technology in the United States. Uh, there's a lot of exciting things going on. This thing uh, in, in this particular area, combining uh, diagnostic ultrasound and therapeutic ultrasound has an enormous potential and the bioengineering department is certainly leading the way in this in the United States. Young man? Educational program. We talk about research, but uh, you like to train our yes, the undergraduate students and graduate students to be able to to research in this area. So uh, in the last two years, uh, we developed this uh, the, the medical imaging and image guided therapy track course sequence. The medical imaging course, uh, rather than only focusing on medical physics aspect or medical imaging, this is more. Uh, the balanced view of medical imaging, uh, sorry, including medical physics and uh, image processing. So that's the bioengineering 420 that will be offered for the first time in four quarters. And uh, we have a systems engineering and electronic medicine. Uh, the link there is uh, probably not as strong here. So if we, if we want, we can, if we don't have 470 and want to take 568, uh, certainly we can allow that. But 420 is absolutely required. So medical imaging to uh, graduate level course, the joint bioengineering and EE course on image processing algorithms and systems. This uh, and a couple of other courses are the course after yesterday asked the question whether one course alone can get students a job. And uh, I responded, yeah, there are several courses. One of them is uh, this one. If you do that, if you pass, and survive at the end of the course, so this course is going on now, this course. So this, we describe, we discuss, uh, I present the uh, image processing algorithms, systems, applications. In, uh, in this full credit, uh, the laboratory and individual project course. And then uh, we have uh, the, the track here. We have an MRI in biomedicine. And we have an ultrasound transducer and signal processing. And then uh, we have a the, the very advanced course, 585, which has not been developed yet, uh, with in the title of image guided therapy. Most likely using uh, the ultrasound and MR combination. So there will be a, uh, maybe half of the course on ultrasound, therapeutic ultrasound, and some uh, the the component will be MR and some others. And then we have uh, optics and microscopy, talking about biomedical optics, lasers and others. And then this is uh, the more EE-oriented course. Uh, it's a joint course between EE and bio, advanced media process and programming. If you want to go for the converting, if you open up the some machine, even now, most of the cases you will find about 10 of these books. I can uh, promise or I can bet that in the next five years that 10 of those four will fit into about two of these chips in terms of computation. And in 1990, the material cost alone of this board was $10,000. Material cost of this chip, if the yeah, company buys in bulk, is $40. So we are going through that kind of revolutionary changes. And if you want to take advantage of it and you know, learn uh, how to do it, then this is the course. So I can tell you from my experience, this course and this course, the yeah, one course alone, if you survive uh, there, can get your job. And this is a heavily engineering oriented course. And this one is more science, medical physics, but with some engineering. And this one also uh, science and engineering combined. And this one yeah, all combined. MRI, you might consider that more, more science-oriented at this point. So my recommendation to those students in the medical imaging and imaging guided therapy track, not only, yeah, science is a lot more interesting. 
and fun when you are doing research. But don't forget engineering part. Have some strong engineering background. That will help you when you get out here uh, with a PhD degree, whether you go to academia or particularly if you go to industry. So, as I said, uh, in the field, yeah, we are working on the low cost of some machine, not $20,000 machine, but $1,000 machine, using uh, several of these chips, and the highest cost will be transducer. And we have a prototype system being built. And so, what are the five growth areas in the department? Obviously, medical imaging and image radiotherapy. E to H2, suite diagnosis and home health care, engineer biomaterials and tissue engineering, and molecular bioengineering and nanotechnology, and computational bioengineering. And as you can see, uh, imaging is a, an enabling technology. It supports, like a B to H2 here, it supports B to H2, and it supports like uh, uh, engineered biomaterial because uh, uh, right now uh, the, the researchers here are using imaging technology to understand uh, the, the chemical composition of the biomaterial surface. And uh, certainly computational bioengineering, they use a lot of imaging, PET imaging and, uh, and other more functional imaging. And uh, molecular bioengineering and, and nanotechnology with the emerging molecular imaging technology they will be heavily dependent on an imaging. So imaging has a yeah, direct clinical component, like a, the prostate the, uh, the imaging type, but imaging can be used in research in many different uh, bioengineering areas as well. So in conclusion, medical imaging and uh, image guided therapy track, uh, we have made significant contribution to medical imaging advances, particularly in diagnostic and therapeutic ultrasound in the past by the Department of Bioengineering. And uh, we have become uh, the leading center for research and education in medical imaging and image guided therapy. And uh, we have developed a well-integrated systems-oriented course sequence it's start with a senior level course of 420 all the way to the 585, which is a very advanced uh, image guided therapy course. And the imaging enables other thrust areas in the department. And key in imaging, especially in the, the clinical application, imaging with clinical application, working closely with clinicians. And we, we, we do that all the time. From radiology to neurosurgery to OBGYN and, and other surgery department. And all the uniqueness of our imaging program is uh, the many companies are working with the UW. Many imaging companies are working with the UW. These days, even non-imaging companies want to use imaging technologies, giving us uh, the avenues to bring our R&D results quickly to routine clinical use. This is probably the one of the, uh, the joys of being uh, the researcher, seeing your R&D results being used clinically, routinely. If you go to a hospital and say, oh, that's my invention. And UW will continue to play a major leadership role in the development of revolutionary new imaging technologies. For, for example, using HIFU, that could revolutionize the operating room uh, in this century into bloodless surgery. And low-cost ultrasound machine, how about $399 ultrasound machine sold over the, at the Costco for home use, for drug delivery enhancement, and, yeah, and not only diagnosis, but for also some, not at the thousand, yeah, the watt type the power, but and molecular imaging using the micro PET, micro the MRI, and micro CT, and their clinical applications. So imaging is a, the area with a lot of promises, and uh, the good combination of uh, science and engineering and clinical application. So I, I encourage you to to get trained well here and go out into the, the real world, academia and the industry and become the future leaders.
So now, Larry and I will be available for questions for the next five to seven minutes. Maybe. Larry, you can come. I'll be the microphone now. Questions? Sandy. Uh, young man, you mentioned uh, the transducer being the highest cost of a low-cost machine. Uh -huh. When you include that cost, are you including the cost of the cables? Because my understanding is that the arrays, if you have 128... Uh, Typically, tra arrays, transducer means including the cables, yes. Okay. But you know, they, uh, you can put a, uh, a wireless chip on there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> As the young one was pointing out, you can get those ASICs and you can get the transmitter, the wireless transmitter, so that you can get it down very close to uh, the front end, the source. transducer itself, the source. You know, you lose a lot of power going up the cable. Mm -hmm. So if you could transmit that into another system, then you have amplification not in the cable and all the way, but right in the device that receives it. So. Mm -hmm. Other questions? Comments? Uh, uh, Arthur. <laughs> I can ask when they get to I've been uh, thinking of going on to the industry after, and I know DL is such a hotbed for um, a research companies, R&D companies. Um, do you see that as because um, of the, the technology major at the University of Washington, or do you see that as um, do that, do that some other reason. What are the trends going to be in the next um, five to ten years? Well, I, you know, the uh, just the starting of Sonosite, in which they hope to be up to two, three hundred people. Uh, uh, ATL employs uh, over five thousand people, and Siemens bought Accuson, which is a California company which employs several thousand people, and they were thinking of moving them up here. And so you might even talk about, you know, thousands of jobs in ultrasound alone. Here. So uh, this is, you take Siemens market share and Sonocyte's market share and ATL's market share, uh, close to 50% of the ultrasound machines made in the world might be in this area. We're talking about enormous uh, concentration here. And these people need guys like you if you take those courses and do a good job at Martin. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, we are good job in research is yeah, good. But don't forget the courses. Have some fundamentals covered. Okay. They, otherwise uh, they they might consider you as a too narrowly focused. I can also comment that we in the therapy area, sort of related area, there are four companies that started in the Seattle area. They're all startups. And you can make the number of uh, people employed on, you know, sort of on a couple of hands, but just wait. Someday <laughs> we hope to be in the thousands also. Larry and I counted about six months ago how many companies uh, in Seattle area work with uh, either the, uh, his group and uh, my group, and we counted about 14 companies. Yeah. So from my perspective, UW perspective, yes, the, the, the reason that we see all these ultrasound companies or medical imaging companies in this area is a uh, UW's leadership and, uh, among others, bioengineering is uh, the contribution. But bioengineering is not the only department. We have a surgery department and other, other department contributing to that attractiveness of, uh, of uh, being in Seattle. But another thing I can tell you now, probably in early 90s, was Seattle was considered as a, having a critical mass in ultrasound industry. So engineer can uh, yeah, move from one company to the other. So if you set up a new company, you can kind of recruit some good engineers from existing companies, rather than trying to bring them all from out of town. So I think I agree with Larry that uh, this will only go up. I don't, I don't, I doubt that it will go down. Yes. Uh, you just focus on the medical imaging and the imaging guided 
image guided okay well you know in the image guided uh, therapy that we're doing now uh, when I was in uh, Chongqing uh, to, to see how these things work in China um, they do all these scans for example if you had a tumor in the pancreas you can see that with ultrasound you can do it with MR and you can see it better and so forth you can see it with ultrasound so what they do and I didn't have a chance to go into detail but they have an ultrasound imaging system that detects the tumor and then that's coupled together with the therapy system so the therapy is being applied to the tumor while you're watching it in real time with the imaging system and so of course this and then you can monitor it the next day you can go in and you can take a little handheld thing and scan and can see what's happening you don't have to put them in a great big machine and run a $700 MR scan that takes an hour or so so ultrasound in particularly in the use of a contrast agents imagine for example that you damage the uh, tumor so there's no longer perfusion into that damaged area then you could use these collar doppler things and you can see there's no blood flow inside there that must be a damaged area wonderful wonderful thing this ultrasound <laughs> okay planning I, I didn't mention planning because uh, it's done routinely like a uh, doctor surgeons use a uh, CT and MR and chest x-ray routinely before the surgery so they can kind of develop a plan okay this is my cause of attack and but what I mentioned in my presentation is a uh, preoperative imaging modality and intraoperative imaging modality the real-time registration like using ultrasound as an intraoperative imaging modality and CT and MR as preoperative imaging modality the one thing is that as soon as you open up some certain area and start yeah, taking some the, the tumor, tumor area out then preoperative imaging uh, images become more or less useless.